This is the sixth session in the course, The Byzantine Empire, and the title of this particular session is Weathering the Storm, the Arabs. This slide is of the great battle of Lalakaon in 863, which is the definitive end of any Arab attempt at conquering the remaining territories of the empire. Although the tide had turned in the empire's favour several generations beforehand, there were still occasional threats, and some of these threats could prove serious. This was the victory that ended any hope of continued Arab attacks against the empire. But this comes right at the end of our period. Let's have a look at the beginning of this period. We go back to not quite where we finished last week. We go back to the middle of where we were last week. This is the rough geography of the Mediterranean world around 615. You'll see that the Persian Empire has swallowed up the whole of Egypt, the whole of Syria, and all of the eastern territories of the empire. The empire itself is a rump. It is the territory of what is now Western Turkey and of the Balkans, with a number of possessions in Italy and a large but incalculable part of North Africa, plus possibly, we don't know really, but plus possibly a certain amount of southern Spain. It looks as though the empire is about to disintegrate. However, after 622, the Emperor Heraclius manages to pull things together and he inflicts a number of surprising but devastating defeats on the Persians. The Persians are stretched as tight as the Byzantines and they are not able to recover from these defeats. Their entire state system collapses. The Persian Empire implodes. When peace is made, it is made on the basis of the status quo ante, and so the empire does not acquire any new territories. Instead, it regains all the territories that it had lost after 604, and it has what seems to be the inestimable advantage over previous generations that it no longer faced a large and united and powerful Persian Empire to its east. It no longer faced any particular threat on its borders. Unless, of course, you take the Lombards as a threat. But by this period, the Lombards have taken as much of Italy as they can take for the moment. And it looks as though the empire is at peace. It isn't. What has happened is that in the Arabian Peninsula, a part of the Near East to which nobody has paid any attention for a long time, it is a place from which raiders occasionally emerge. It is a place where you recruit mercenary soldiers. It is a place through which you sometimes travel in order to do business. It is not in itself an enormously important place. But the Arabian Peninsula at the end of the 6th century is a place that is going through a completely unexpected moral revolution. Muhammad, around 565 to 632, has united the Arabs of the peninsula under his new religion. He claims that he is the last and the greatest messenger of God. His new religion is rather like Christianity, so far as it believes in proselytizing, it believes in converting new peoples. And the followers of this new religion feel an overpowering duty to spread the 
message of their religion by whatever means possible and wherever possible, and this includes war. In 634, the successors of Muhammad send out what may have been intended as a raiding party into Syria. Instead, they find that the province is entirely undefended, so they push further and further forward. Then they come to cities, and although the cities are surrounded by walls, the cities put up no defence. Instead, the people inside those cities throw open the gates and welcome the invaders in. Something strange is happening there. News gets back to Constantinople that Syria is under attack. Heraclius himself hurries south at the head of the largest army that he can put together. But remember, the empire is insolvent. The empire has no money to spend on defence at the moment. Heraclius has a very small, a rather underpaid and underprepared army. He leads these people into battle against a smaller force, but a smaller force of people who believe that ahead of them lies either victory in this world or, or blessings in the next world. And at the Battle of Yarmouk in 636, the imperial armies led by Heraclius himself collapse. Heraclius looks at the correlation of forces and he decides to evacuate Syria. As simple as that. There is no possibility of regrouping and counterattacking. He looks at what is happening. He realizes that Syria is lost. Even though he's lost only one battle, he withdraws. He withdraws north. And after that, all the Syrian cities fall almost at once. Damascus, Tarsus, Antioch, Jerusalem. No further battles. The gates are opened. The Arabs walk in and they are acclaimed as the new leaders of Syria. And as I said, that is the end of Byzantine rule in Syria. It is the end of a period of Greek domination that began a thousand years earlier with the conquest by Alexander the Great. And then, a few years later in 639, the Arabs invade Egypt, where the pattern is repeated. The Egyptians open their gates one after the other. The only city that doesn't open its gates is Alexandria, where there remains a large number of Greeks. And it takes a while before Alexandria falls. But everywhere else in Egypt, there is an enthusiastic throwing off of imperial rule. And once again, for a thousand years, Egypt had been ruled by a Greek-speaking minority ever since the conquest by Alexander the Great. After Alexander, you had the dynasty of the Ptolemies. After that, you had Roman imperial rule. And this, of course, continues into the Byzantine period because there is no institutional break until in 642 Alexandria falls and Egypt passes out of Byzantine or Western or Roman or Christian domination. Call it what you will. At the same time, Persia is overrun in a single season. The Persian Empire has not recovered from the defeat by Heraclius. It has broken up into a series of smaller states. These are mopped up, as I said, in one season. And so the Islamic world is established. And here is a map showing this world. This is the Islamic world at its greatest extent in its Western medieval conquests. It would, of course, eventually expand to take in the whole of what is now Turkey plus the Balkans. Indeed, it would eventually get as far as Vienna for a short period. 
but this shows the expansion of Islam at its greatest medieval extent and it expands very very rapidly reasons for this success yes how is it that the Arabs managed to conquer and not only to conquer because conquest can be quite easy especially if you catch your enemies by surprise but to conquer and then to hold how is it that they managed to do that and there is a number of reasons one is that islam is historically a very tolerant faith if you want to judge islam in practice by the standards set down in right by writers like john locke or john stuart mill you'll find it sadly wanting but then that is the nature of things but if you judge islam in practice by the standards of the byzantine empire it is a very tolerant system there is of course a certain pressure to convert but this is not often a violent pressure christians jews zoroastrians those are allowed to keep their property they're allowed to keep most of their places of worship they are not physically compelled to convert they must pay a special tax they must suffer certain legal discriminations but they are allowed to keep their places of worship and they are largely left to govern themselves you can see the footprint of the islamic conquest of southeastern europe to this day if you go to hungary there are large protestant communities if you go across the border into slovakia my wife's country it is almost entirely catholic the reason for that was that hungary was ruled by the turks until quite close to the end of the 17th century and it had been ruled by the turks since the early 16th century during this time the turks had absolutely no interest in the various disputes of the reformation and counter-reformation so protestant denominations were allowed to flourish in the areas of turkish control whereas across the danube in slovakia in the habsburg lands protestantism was rather firmly suppressed remember that although the empire was not always a heavy-handed persecutor it had persecuted the monophysites and the monophysites found that the arabs offered them complete religious toleration as such they accepted it the arabs also in the early period at least offered much lower taxes and much lower economic regulation and the particular trend of their conquests opened up a very large free trade area extending from the shores of the mediterranean right down to the indian ocean further reasons the syrian and egyptian natives they were linguistically and culturally rather similar to the arabs and i've said quite a lot about the possible overlap between monophysite christianity and most of the early variants of islam the greek language and greek communities don't vanish overnight from these green areas conquered by the arabs greek remains the official language of egypt for well over a hundred years after the arab conquest it also remains the official language of Syria for a long time after the initial conquest. There were still rather large Greek communities in Egypt as late as 1967 when President Nasser expelled all the Greeks from Alexandria. So the Greek language and the Greek peoples settled in these areas do not disappear. Indeed, it is likely that egypt and syria 
themselves remained majority Christian regions until the Black Death, when you have another reset. But whatever the case, once the Arabs had conquered Egypt and Syria, it turned out that there was no way back. There was no chance of an imperial reconquest. These areas were lifted straight out of the run of systems established by Alexander a thousand years earlier. It is a fundamental break in history. However, although the empire has lost all of its peripheral territories, it's lost Egypt and Syria, there is no Islamic success against the core territories of the empire, that is the territories of modern Turkey and a few other parts. The reasons for that? One is that these areas are now Greek in language and they are orthodox in faith. And remember what I spoke about last week, the reforms of Heraclius. These reforms have given ordinary people a stake in the survival of the empire and perhaps they don't regard it as an empire, they regard it as the survival of their nation. The Roman Empire was a vast multinational and therefore a vast multicultural agglomeration, whereas by about 650, the core territories of what we must now call the Byzantine Empire are remarkably homogenous in language and faith. These are Greek-speaking Orthodox Christians, and they will fight for their nation, and in particular they will fight for their land, because remember, in the new order of things, ordinary people have inalienable grants of land in exchange for military service. They will fight, and they did fight. A further consideration is that after the first few generations, after the first explosion, the Arabs, or perhaps Islam we should now call it, because it embraces more than just the Arabs now, whatever you want to call it, the Arabs or Islam, it loses its first impetus. You might say that the caliphs become decadent, they become degenerate. Or you might simply say they become much more civilized and they settle down to enjoy the delights of civilized life. And here are some of them. These are wall paintings or mosaics from the palaces of the caliphs in Damascus. You can see that life was rather jolly for the rulers of the Islamic world after its establishment. Dancing girls, dancing boys, wine, opium, all manner of diversions, all manner of physical diversions, and of course intellectual diversions, a great deal of art, some very beautiful art produced at this time. Although the rulers of the new caliphate do not stop from being Muslims, their conception of Islam is somewhat different from those of the Islamic State people who are currently making a nuisance of themselves in Syria and Afghanistan. These people have no particular interest in fighting a continuing war with the empire. They will fight wars with the empire, and they still believe that the empire must be entirely conquered, and that this will be a prelude to an Islamic conquest of Europe, and therefore the completion of the mission of their prophet, which is to bring all the peoples of the world under the one true faith, but although they are willing to pay lip service to this ambition, and although on at least two occasions they are willing to give it a serious go, it is for the most part a secondary ambition. And 
the ebbing of Islamic impetus after the first explosion gives the empire time to continue its internal reforms and to bring about the circumstances in which it will not only survive but flourish. I've spoken of the vague ambition that the caliphs continue to have for the conversion of the whole world, which must begin with the conquest of Constantinople. And this brings me to the first siege of Constantinople in 674 to 678. The emperor at this time was Constantine IV, one of the great grandsons, I believe, of Heraclius. The empire has been through a period of internal chaos. There has been a civil war, and whoever reigns in Constantinople does not sit very securely on his throne. The caliphs take advantage of this in 674. They raise an enormous army for a knockout blow against the empire. Their caliph Muawiyah, a man who himself is of somewhat disputed legitimacy as the caliph for reasons that it would take a very long time to explain, squeezes the largest army he can manage together from the immense resources of his empire. He sends them against the empire. This army smashes straight across the borders. It rolls over the peasant armies which have so far secured the empire from conquest. He hurries forward to the capital, to Constantinople, and at the same time, and it, is, it may be a coordinated push, the northern barbarians, the Avars and the Slavs, they invade the Danube provinces of the empire, and the city, Constantinople, for a while becomes effectively the empire itself. Nearly all the other territories, except for North Africa and the Mediterranean islands, are taken from the empire. The borders of the empire, for what it matters, shrink to the walls of Constantinople itself, which is now under close siege. The Islamic fleets sail at will through the Propontis. Constantinople goes through a four-year siege. Food begins to run short because the empire has lost control of the seas. There are proposals that before the final storm of the city, which is surely not that long in coming, the emperor will dress himself up as a common sailor and somehow slip out past the Islamic blockade and get himself to Carthage and carry on the empire's resistance from the west. But it does look as though everything is up for the empire. In the previous generation, it had lost Egypt and Syria. In this generation, it seemed likely to lose everything else. And then something completely unexpected happens. Unfortunately, we don't have very good contemporary histories of what did happen. But something like this happened. The Islamic navies are absolutely dominant. They control all the seas around Constantinople. They control the Black Sea, they control the Aegean Sea, they control the Propontis or the Sea of Marmara. They have full naval domination. All that they don't dominate is the Golden Horn, which is the harbour of Constantinople, and that is secured by a large bronze chain that prevents ships from entering. At some time in 678, that chain is lowered so that a small fleet is able to sail out of the Golden Horn and to direct itself straight at the main Islamic fleet. This small flotilla of warships 
gets closer and closer and closer to the main Islamic navy. I should imagine that the Arab captains were looking at this fleet, wondering what was going to happen. Were, had these people come to surrender? Was it to be some last futile resistance? What was going to happen? And then what happens is this. The Byzantines use their new weapon against the Islamic fleet. It's called Greek fire. It's one of the great technological advances of the Middle Ages. We don't know entirely what it is because it was, at the time, a very closely guarded secret. The story is that it was invented by a man called Kalinikos. He took his invention to the emperor, it was tried out, and then it took a couple of years of research and development, first of all to develop this liquid, and then to develop a delivery mechanism. But when it was first tried out at the first siege of Constantinople, it destroyed the entire Islamic navy as spat out by the bronze pipes on this small flotilla. Greek fire would shoot up to a quarter of a mile across the water. It would stick to wooden ships and burn them to the waterline. There was no putting out of the fire. If you poured water on the fire, the, the water would burn. The fire, when it fell, onto the sea would just lie there in burning patches. Eventually the Arabs discover that urine can put out the fire, sometimes, but not perfectly. But at first this is a completely devastating weapon to which there is no answer. As I said, we don't know much for certain about its composition. It must be petrol-based, it must be oil-based, a great deal of effort has gone in the past century or so into trying to reconstruct not only Greek fire itself, but the propelling weapons. And well, there's another representation of the effect that this stuff has on ships. Now, coming back to the Greek fire, this is a modern representation of it on the left. On the right, you have an interesting further development, a handheld flamethrower. The archaeology doesn't tell us much about this because we've never found any of these machines. We have to put them together from guesswork. Here is a rough reconstruction of it. You have a boiler, you have a large kettle filled with some kind of oil-based solution. Underneath this, you have a fire which is heating it, causing it to give off a large amount of gas which is confined within this kettle. You have a syringe or a pump on the left. This pumps air into the kettle. The vapour, and I think the vapour would have come out through the top rather than the bottom on this illustration, it doesn't matter. Not liquid, I think, but vapour travelled up this pipe on the right into the propelling pipe. You set fire to the end of the propelling pipe and give a good pump on that left syringe and that will send out a jet of burning gas or burning gaseous liquid and as I said, it will shoot up to a quarter of a mile across the water. It is a completely unstoppable weapon. There is no defence against it. If you find that the enemy ships in a sea battle are equipped with Greek fire, all you can do is turn about and sail away or row away as quickly as you can and hope that you will not be pursued. Greek fire can also be used on land. Ships can sail in close to the land and let this loose on an army that is conveniently close. Or 
you can use it in land-based heavy artillery plus if you look at that picture again let me go back to it handheld projecting weapons it could be used as some kind of early flamethrower it could also be buried in pots and used as a kind of minefield you could booby trap abandoned fortifications so that it was on a long fuse as the enemy rushes into what it thinks is an abandoned fortification the whole thing blows sky high it was this weapon and it is such a shame that we know so little about the first siege of constantinople but it is this weapon which turns this arab or islamic knockout blow into a catastrophic defeat for the islamic armies of the vast numbers of soldiers and ships who set out so confidently from damascus to deliver this knockout blow against the empire an insignificant burned fraction makes its way back to damascus and the caliph muawiyah is a broken man the caliphate sues for peace with the empire and is compelled to pay tribute so the empire has survived the first real attempt on the empire itself not an attempt on taking provinces away from the empire as had happened in the 630s with the loss of syria and then egypt and later on with the loss that i won't discuss of north africa this is an attempt to destroy the empire by taking constantinople and the first time this is tried it is a catastrophic failure that however is not the end of the islamic threat to the empire if we go forward now from the 670s to 717 there is another attempt at a knockout blow a generation later the empire is again going through a period of internal weakness there's a change of ruling house in constantinople there are religious divisions within the empire the arabs think that they can take advantage of this internal weakness and preoccupation and so they assemble what is said to be an army of 200,000 men and 5,000 ships the arabs accept that they are at a disadvantage where technology is concerned but they think that they can overcome this by force of numbers again this vast army rolls unstoppably forward through asia minor until it arrives under the walls of constantinople and then the byzantine navy goes back into action again using greek fire but an improved kind of greek fire an improved mixture and a greatly improved delivery mechanism and once again this is used to destroy all of the islamic fleets and then to attack the undefended islamic armies all around the shores of the propontis the arab historians report that of the 200,000 men sent out for this conquest of constantinople 150,000 are lost under the walls of the city the arabs turn up to besiege the city they find themselves under siege and they find themselves resorting to cannibalism eventually the arabs withdraw from the walls of constantinople in chaos and they are ruthlessly harried as they run back along the coastal roads towards damascus the cost of this catastrophic failed invasion bankrupts the caliphate and provides an almost fatal blow to its prestige although the arabs don't go away although this is not the end to continuing islamic raids across the frontier this is the end of 
effective hopes or fears that the Arabs will conquer the whole of the empire and that they will take Constantinople. Unfortunately, once again, we don't know that much about this second siege of 717 to 718. Most of the accounts are written a long time after the event and they are concerned with other matters from the ones that most interest us. But there is no doubt that this is one of the most significant and decisive battles in history. In its first century, in its first 80 years, let's say, Islam has conquered every enemy it encounters. It has destroyed Persia. It has destroyed the Visigoths. It has destroyed the Central Asian confederacies. It is spreading unchecked in every direction. The only enemy it fails to defeat is the empire. And not only does it fail to defeat the empire, but the empire inflicts two very significant defeats upon it. These are the only worthwhile defeats that Islam receives in its first 80 years of existence. You might say that the much better known victory of the Franks at the Battle of Tours in 732 is the first real defeat that the Muslims receive. But bear in mind that the Muslims are at the end of supply chains that are about 3,000 miles long, immensely long supply chains. And even if you assume that the base from which they're launching their operations is Islamic Spain, it's still a, a long way to go across the Pyrenees into France. Whereas Constantinople is right on the border with the Islamic world. The Arabs or the Caliphs or the Islamic rulers are able to assemble whatever forces they can at leisure and they are able to direct them from 10 or 20 days march. And even so, they fail. So it is a series of decisive victories, and these help to shape the rest of the Middle Ages. And what this means is that the empire survives. The new ruling house, Isaurian dynasty, this rules the empire from 717 until 802. That's nearly a century. It saves and then stabilizes the empire. It maintains and continues the whole series of radical reforms begun by Heraclius a hundred years earlier. And I said last week that if you had fallen asleep in the year 500 and you'd woken up in the year 700 in the empire you would have found a totally different world and yes it is a changed empire the fact that the empire survives does not mean that anything particularly recognizable about the empire survives the reason the empire does survive is that it is a radically changed empire most obviously, the senatorial aristocracy has entirely disappeared. The emperors keep up an outward show of autocracy. The emperor continues to be carried around Constantinople, dressed in purple robes, while people sing hymns of praise to his divine majesty. But, in effect, the emperor is accountable to the people and to the church. The empire is dominated by a greatly reduced imperial bureaucracy. It's dominated by the church and it's dominated by peasant communes that are self-governing, that are untroubled by the central authorities except when it's necessary to provide men for armies of defence. 
the cities shrivel. They fall into ruin, and that's where they remain until the archaeologists begin digging them up in the 19th century. Those cities which don't disappear, cities like Thessalonica, Corinth, Ephesus, and so on, those are greatly downsized. Many of them shrink from large cities of 50 or 150,000 people all the way down to small towns of 5,000 and sometimes to the status of walled villages. Ephesus, for example, the traditional area of Ephesus was abandoned after about 650. The entire population, the entire surviving population of Ephesus abandoned the traditional site of Ephesus and moved up a hill to build a citadel and that was Ephesus for the next several centuries. Constantinople itself, we don't know that much about the medieval city but there is reason to believe that the city fell from a population of not far short of a million to a population of about 70 or maybe 50,000 people and that most of the city inside the walls was first of all in ruins and then given over to various kinds of market gardening and that even the ceremonial centre of the city uh, shrank. It shrank to the main churches and a few other public buildings. Many of the great palaces and other considerable buildings that had been put there between Constantine and Justinian were allowed to fall into ruin, or they were made into quarries for improving the, the, the fortifications of the city. The long line of classical scholarship that begins with the Alexandrian scholars of about 300 BC comes to an end. There are no significant losses of ancient literature because papyrus has been replaced by parchment and the libraries continue to stand. But it does seem that for generation after generation, the libraries were maintained but largely unvisited. And within this much reduced or downsized empire, with a much smaller population and a radically different social structure, you have first of all the end of the long decline that begins in the reign of Justinian and then you have at first a slow and almost unnoticed recovery which steadily firms itself until by about the middle of the ninth century the empire has re-established itself as the greatest and richest state in the Eastern Mediterranean world. But that is another story. So what we've looked at in the past few weeks is how the Roman Empire that we know and recognize, the later Roman Empire, let's say, is deliberately broken apart some parts of it are allowed to fall away or are stripped away but within the core territories most of the defining institutions of the later roman empire a large bureaucracy a large landed nobility and a substantially urban civilization disappear and are replaced by a very different kind of civilization a civilization that is still Greek and is still Orthodox Christian, indeed that is much more fervently Greek and much, much more fervently Orthodox Christian than before. But a Greek and a Christian population which is fundamentally different from anything that would have been recognized by Constantine or his successors or by Justinian. 
but the empire has survived. It is the only state in the Middle Ages that f looked radical Islam in the eye and remained on its feet. And that is an achievement. It's an achievement which is usually overlooked, but it is a great achievement. And here you have a map of the new world of the Middle Ages. That purple area that follows the course of the Danube, that encloses the Balkans, for most of this period, that has been lost to the Empire. The Empire keeps Thessalonica and the regions around Thessalonica. It keeps a few coastal strips. It keeps Athens and Corinth and the eastern part of the Peloponnese. It keeps the Mediterranean islands, but large parts of the Balkans and large parts even of Greece are lost to the empire. The empire loses most of Italy, and these borders are notional. We don't really think that the empire controlled all of these territories in northern Italy, but it does maintain the far south of Italy, and it does for a long time maintain Sicily and Corsica and Sardinia, but its core territories are Asia Minor, or the territories of modern Turkey, the Aegean Islands, and the eastern strip of what is now Greece. That is the empire as it emerges from the great challenge of Islam that ends in 717. It is an enormously reduced empire. If you consider the empire ruled by Constantine the Great, which goes all the way up to York and which embraces every shore of the Mediterranean world. Or if you take even the empire that Justinian left in 565, which embraces the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean and much of the West. This is a greatly reduced empire, but it is an empire within which a population of Greek-speaking Orthodox Christians maintain their way of life and are eventually able to turn their empire once again into the richest and most powerful state in the Mediterranean world, which is what it will remain until the end of the 11th century and perhaps until the end of the 12th century. So that's not all I have to say, but that's all I have to say based on these slides. So let me now give way to questions or comments. Let me come out of the slideshow and let me stop sharing screen. Any questions or comments?